Good morning. Welcome this morning. Really excited to see everybody. I'm excited to be here. Hope that you are too. And uh, we just want to stand. Uh, we want to worship the Lord this morning. We serve an awesome and mighty God. We just want to give him glory, honor, and thanks today. clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise, for who can stop the Lord Almighty, and our God is a lion, the lion of Judah, he's roaring with power, and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him and our god is a lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his love breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb the gates, make way before the King of Kings, our God who comes to save, is here to set the captives free, who can stop the Lord Almighty, and our God is a lion, the lion of Judah, he's roaring with power, and Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting. Every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His love breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion. Serve an awesome and mighty God. You may be seated. Uh, I'm Dr. Matt Bain, medical doctor in Albany. Uh, I've been here for 20 years. My family and I attend JBC. I'm one of the elders. And several years ago, I took Dee's leadership class. That's what I want to talk to you guys about. One of the best things I've ever done in my life was taking that class. Really helped me learn how to set goals, not just in regular parts of my life, but in my spiritual life and how to proactively grow rather than just coast along. So I'd highly recommend you take the class. It's one of the best things you'll ever do. And I know you'll be like me and you'll think, I don't have time to do this. And that's the whole point really of the class is you won't think you just have the time passively, but this class teaches you how to structure your time proactively and be way more 
goal oriented in what you do. And I think you'll find it's one of the best decisions you ever make in your life. So hopefully you give this class a shot. Thanks. <clears throat> I love you. Good to see you all. If you're interested in the class, have questions at the end of the service on the prayer card, just write on there. I want information on the leadership class, and I'll connect with you on that. Starts October, first weekend of October, and so I encourage you to plug into that if you haven't yet done so. There's a whole bunch of things going to start here soon. This is when everything starts, and so in order to, uh, we want God to bless, and so September 12th through the 19th, Monday through Friday, we have a five-day prayer event. We pray five in the morning till 10 in the morning, five in the evening till 10 in the evening. You can come pray, and that's Monday through Friday. You can come pray one hour of the five days, or you can pray 50 hours during the five days. Whatever you want to do, commit to, it's a great time. You will be blessed spiritually, personally. You can come. If you're if praying out loud is not your thing, just agree with those who are. There's plenty who will. But we focus on our ministries in September, this particular five-day prayer event. We pray for Awana. We pray for small group. We pray for youth group. We pray for every ministry in our church. We have reports about them. And so it's a great time of praying and asking God to work and to bless in all these various areas. So uh, September 12th, th that week, don't plan any fishing trips uh, or whatever. Take off from mowing your lawn. Just one thing. Five days, you can do anything. Uh, and so focus on prayer that week and sleep less, eat less, do everything less pray more, and God will bless. It'll be great, 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 great time. So I encourage you to put that on your calendar and consider it. I want to starting uh, next week, September 7th, Wednesday night, and it's all the way down from little kids up through high school over in the gym, and uh, the same time I want is happening. We have a service in here, and so it's a, be a great way to spend your Wednesday evening. Consider that. You can look in the bulletin and see everything that's going to be starting. Check it all out and read about it. And uh, good to see you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. And we've come seeking you, wanting to grow. And we ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts, that you would touch us, stir us, motivate us, convict us. And uh, Lord, we ask especially that you would fill uh, Dr. Bain with your spirit. You'd speak through him. And just stir each of us with the power of your word. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know what this is? We continue to worship this morning. Stand up. Give him honor and thanks today. We want to be in his grace and his love and uh, sing of his goodness. And in you who are living, in you who are moving, in you who are finding who we are Skies. We lift our hands and seek your presence and find ourselves in who you are. And I worship you, Father of lights, Spirit of truth. And I worship you, Jesus, we call on you. Yes, we call on you. And I worship you, Father of lights. 
spirit of truth. And I worship you, Jesus. We call on you. Yes, we call on you, Jesus. We call on you. Yes, we call on you. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing it your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise to you only. All the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise and our hearts will cry these bones will sing great There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning with the love that cast out fear. You are working in our waiting. 
sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you are faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us wisdom you were wisdom could understand your ways, reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace, you're the lifter of the lowly, compassionate and kind. Surround and you who uphold me, and your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood, you are faithful. valley you are faithful you're working for our good you're working for our good for your glory and even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our good for your glory even in the valley you are faithful you're working for our good, you're working for our good, for your glory, your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us, with us in the fire and the flood, you are faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. in the fire and the flood. You are faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are sovereign over us. Lord, you are sovereign. seated. And mind, and so this is going to just be a continuation from some of that. We'll go a little bit more. So we're going to talk about our heart and mind kind of part two, 
and you've got uh, these objectives are in the outline there in, in the notes if you want to go through those. So we're going to start with looking at our flesh and our sin nature. Then we're going to look at the heart and the mind again, a little bit of review. Then we'll look at strength and how you might measure strength, and we'll close with circumcision. You might think that's a little funny, but I thought Brandon talked about it last week, so we're going to double dose you on circumcision this week uh, as well. We'll start up here with the flesh. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, 5 and 6. So number one in your notes, this principle, our sin nature begins at conception. Our life begins at conception too. So for sure in the Bible, you see Samson in the Old Testament, you have John the Baptist, you have Jesus. All three of those are talked about being a living person while still in the womb. So our life begins at conception. Medically, we know that. Sin nature starts at conception too. Everyone conceived naturally has a sin nature. How about the conception of Christ? Well, he had the feminine singular egg of the woman, but there is no human male sperm. So that, of course, the sin nature must come from the Father. Jesus had no sin nature. Who else didn't? Adam and Eve were not conceived. So they didn't start with a sin nature. They accrued it, and then we've all had it since then. So that's our flesh, our sin nature. Let's look at our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? So we start with this default position, we are deceitful in our heart, and remember that's the interface between our flesh and our mind, our heart is where we make choices, what we choose to want to believe, but that is deceitful. So I'll give you an example of that. Let's just, we'll talk about me and you. Let's say a neutral third party observer ranks us on the the standard one to ten scale, and let's say I'm a six and you're an eight, fine. But what is my heart? Why am I so deceived about that? As I talk and think about myself, if my reality is a six, I will think I'm a nine. Really a 9.9 and really 9.9 and a bunch of those. The only thing keeping me from a 10 is a couple weeks ago I forgot to floss, something like that. But what are you? Well, the reality is I'm a six, you're an eight, but in my deceitful heart, I will view you as a three, maybe a four, and you're lucky you're not a two. You do that too. As we judge one another, we are looking through a distorted lens. Our heart is deceitful. A wise man channels his heart. He doesn't ever follow his heart. So it's deceitful in the way we see ourselves. I find myself doing that in my marriage. If I do, I know you do too. I elevate self and diminish my wife, and then there's a problem because of my sin nature and my deceitful heart. Far worse is when we do that to God. We elevate self and diminish God. I'll show you a thing later on today where we all do that. So as a man thinks within himself, so he is, Proverbs 23, 7, as we think in our heart, so we've got our our flesh, our limbic system, we've got our prefrontal cortex up here, and the heart lies right between them, and that's where we make choices. If we think we're way better than we are, we have a problem. Uh, And so what's the truth about it? The truth is we are all sinful. So if you go to Psalm 14, 2 and 3, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. So I'll often sit in a sermon that Mike or Dee does, and you're thinking, there's some good points in here. And I'll be saying, you know, a guy like Pete... I am sure glad he's sitting in here because he needs this, that sucker. He needs that sermon. And in fact, he's way, he should move up the front because he needs another scoop. You've done that. We've all do that. We look, I'm sure that guy's sitting here. Well, wait a minute. If this verse is true, go to the last one. There is no one who does good. Not, that means me too. I can't think you need it, and I don't. We all do. But look how judgmental we get when we look at other people, and that's wrong. So that's in the Psalms. Number two, there is no one who does good, not even one. No one who does good, not even one. So you might say, yeah, that's Old Testament stuff. We're under grace in the New Testament. Well, Paul, in Romans chapter 3, quotes that Psalm 14, and it's in the New Testament quoted at least twice. Paul quotes that in Romans 3.10. And then he spends several verses quoting Old Testament to go to 323, which we've all memorized a bunch of times, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is exempt from that. So the first issue is, do we accept Christ or not? That's 
the first piece. Once we have, now how do we grow in character? How do we become more like him? So coaching football, I know how to get kids to grow. Some very simple ways. How do you grow? Well, lift weights. You'll get stronger. Run. Go do stuff. You'll get better. You grow. Well, how do you grow in character? That's a lot harder to do. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. I hate trials. I hate bad circumstances. I don't know about you, but I hate going through hard times. But we're supposed to consider that joy knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. That endurance have its perfect result, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Notice this is speaking to the heart here, where you make decisions. It is a conscious act of will to choose to consider it joy. It is not joy. In our culture, what we do is think our emotions are the engine, and we want to hop on motivation, energy, and joy, but that never shows up. We have to consider it when we do not have the emotion. The emotion is then the caboose. When does that show up? After the trial is over and done, and you can finally see character growth. I've seen things in my life. I'm working on one now that's more than 10 years past the event, and I'm still realizing how I grew through it. The emotion of joy does not happen. It's not the engine. It's the caboose. We have to make the decision up front. Number three, it is difficult and contrary to our nature to make the decision to consider trials as joy, to make the decision to consider trials as joy. That requires that we look forward with foresight and not dwell in our misery now, but realize God has sovereignly brought it here for a purpose. He goes on, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So I grew up thinking, hey, you know, I have a chemistry test tomorrow, I better pray for wisdom. Or I need wisdom to navigate a, a problem. That's not what this is talking about at all. What is the context of verse 5? The context is verses 2 and 4, uh, 2 through 4, which is telling you to make the choice to consider your bad circumstances in your trial as joy, because that's going to build your character. That is what God gives you wisdom for. You can't see it on your own, but if we take the time to say, not Lord remove the circumstance, but rather Lord give me wisdom to see what you know I need to shave off and grow, that's the wisdom God gives you. We go on, verse 6, but, so, there's a, so see he's making it very clear, it should be, we just focus on the spots we want, but what? But the guy who's praying for the wisdom, not just for worldly solving stuff, but how to grow in character through the trial, that guy must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That man ought not to expect that he receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. I have fallen into this trap a lot. I focus on what I might receive. When I was a kid, I remember it was a Honda 200X three-wheeler. I wanted to receive that. I never got it. But I prayed for it. And I prayed for all sorts of things. And then you realize that's not what God's talking about here. It's not a tangible item to, to receive. How about if you have injuries? How about an impacted gallstone? How about a kidney stone? How about sciatic pain? How about something like that? And I pray to remove the painful circumstance. That's not what God is talking about. I need to grow through it. So I have prayed to receive. It might even be healing. So I am not saying don't pray for healing. But don't have that be the focus of your prayer because that's simply removing the circumstance. The circumstance is there for the bigger picture of character growth. Pray not to remove the circumstance, but to have the wisdom to see how to grow through it. Double-minded. We talked about the double-minded med student there a month ago. Uh, he, in his heart, believed that for-profit was bad, non-profit was good. He learned that from his education. So he was double-minded as he realized the non-profit MRI is $300 and the for-profit one is $3,000, if you remember that story. And he would sit there and literally cogitate and agitate. He was double-minded. He was holding something in his heart that he could see with his mind wasn't true, but he still wanted to believe it anyway. So when we think we know what we need and we think we know what we want when we're praying to receive something from God rather than what he wants to give us in growth, we are double-minded. We won't receive a darn thing. I have found that to be true with myself, and I wonder why I don't get my, to make it simple, that 300X uh, three-wheeler. Do we doubt? 
Do we believe that God is sovereign in bringing these circumstances into our life for a bigger purpose, or are we irritated at the circumstances? He goes on later in the same passage. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God tests all the time. Here's a test. Abraham, there's your boy Isaac. Here's a knife. Put it in his chest. Abraham goes through the motions of that, and then God saves him from it at the beginning, or at the end. Abraham assumed his son would be resurrected. God does not test so he can see what's in your heart. He already knows what's in your heart. He tests you so you display it to yourself, and we've all done that, where we fall flat, and, oh man, I ruined that one. He's revealing to us our weakness. He already knows what's in our heart. That's testing. Tempting is different. That's, hey, check out the cell phone and the computer and go down this alley of pornography or whatever it is. But let's see how about temptation. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by what? By his own lust, his sin nature. Satan knows exactly how to tickle that, how to poke it and get you. He knows what you're attracted to. And so he tempts you where God tests you to reveal your weakness. Just like a football game. If you lose that game, it revealed your weakness, and you now know how to improve and what you need to do. Later on at the end of this chapter, do not be deceived, my dear brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So how does God start this as James writes it? Do not be deceived. So when God says, don't be deceived, What's going to happen to 97% of us? We will be deceived. So he's telling you, don't be deceived. Move from the 97% over to the champions, the 3% who won't be deceived about whatever this concept is that he's going to be talking about. So don't be deceived about several things. Every good gift comes from where? Above, not from you and not from me. You do a good work, that wasn't you, that was Christ through you. See how deceitful we are with our heart? We think we did something good. Nothing good comes from anywhere other than God from above. That's the first. He is the Father of lights. In Him there is no darkness at all, so we can't be deceived that maybe there's something wrong with God. And then this one, there is no variation. In the Greek, no trope, no turning, not even a shadow of turning with God. What does that mean? He is the capital T, absolute truth that does not move. It doesn't turn. Doesn't turn right, doesn't turn left, doesn't go up, doesn't go down. It is static, it is stationary, it is eternally stable. It's a rock. If there is no turning, that means there is no in-turning as well. Entrope in the Greek. What word do we get? Entropy. Second law of thermodynamics. Decay, wears out, runs out of fuel, moves towards death the curse. Only God is separate from that. He doesn't turn. He doesn't change. He doesn't even intern. And in, in fact, he's immune to interning and decay. Fascinating concept. Don't be deceived. God doesn't get tired. So we're going to test this a little bit. And you're going to have to speak, and you can do it to your neighbor. But D always asks this question. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? Tonight. So I heard heaven, but I want you to answer this to your neighbor, so go ahead and say something, but you need to say where you're going and why. Go ahead. All right, so there's all sorts of answers we'll get. How are we deceived? Well, here, here's the first one for the non-believer. You go to our culture. I ask this to people all the time, and they'll say, well, I'm probably going to heaven. Why? Well, because I, I don't cheat on my taxes. You know, I'm pretty nice. I've only had one affair, but I've never killed anybody. So they're going through the rationale of their actions, and we all know that's garbage. But how did 97% of us, because I did this too, I grew just studying this, how did 97% of us just deceive yourself about your salvation? I'll show you. You die tonight, where are you going to go? I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Because I. Most of us started your answer that way, didn't you? Because I believed, accepted something. How should we answer that question? I'm going to go to heaven because he. Not because I, and then you can fill in the blanks all sorts of ways, but because he not only died on the cross and paid our price, but he 
gave us the power to even choose Him. With our deceitful, sinful heart, we cannot choose God. Yes, you have free will, but it is so puny compared to the sovereignty of God. And in a sinful, cursed heart, you cannot choose Him without Him. How do I know? We'll finish the verse. In the exercise of His will. So James writing in the Greek here is telling you this construction is emphasizing the sovereign will of God is what allows you to have salvation. Yes, you have free will, but that is not sovereign. It is Him that brought you salvation, and Jesus confirms this in John 6, 65. No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So look how so many of us deceive ourselves just in our thinking. It's not that you're not saved, but we think so highly of ourself in the process, especially in relation to God. Number four, it is easy to be deceived about the character and sovereignty of God. Because he or because I? Where did your salvation come from? Look how we elevate self. Is God really good? Does he really know what's best, especially in trials? And is he really in full control of all the events? So now we're going to go to our heart and our mind. And as we look at this, a little bit of review. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Uh, that's in the interface between our limbic system and our mind. That's where we make the choice to choose to set apart Christ as Lord as God. Number five, it is in our heart, you could put ACC for anterior cingulate cortex, in our heart that we choose who or what we want to be our king. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is a beginning of knowledge. Fools, however, despise wisdom and instruction. They don't just dislike it, they actively despise it. So what is wisdom? And you'll, I've seen this a bunch of times in churches and in Christian education areas where they will define wisdom as the application of knowledge. That is a garbage definition. It might be correct on somebody's test, but you won't get that from Scripture. Knowledge, wisdom, two different spiritual gifts. Knowledge is having knowledge of facts, knowing things. I'll prove to you why application of knowledge is a terrible definition of wisdom. Take a dude with 15 PhDs, smarter than all of us in the room put together. He's a brilliant man. He has mastery of multiple facts. However, he's an atheist. He's a humanist. He believes we happen to evolve by chance. We weren't created sovereignly by God. There's chance governing things, not a sovereign God governing things. There's no reason for him to repent. There's no reason for him to seek wisdom from God's word because he knows it all because he has facts. And within that humanistic worldview, he now applies his knowledge. Is he a wise man? No, that's Romans 1. Declaring himself to be wise, he reveals himself to be a fool. Wisdom is moving away from our default position towards this unmoving rock. We can never master it, but we can stand on it. We can stand below it. And the more we see the world like God, that's wisdom. The more we're over here, the world calls that progress, progressivism. As you progress away from the truth in the world, it says you're progressing, but what you're doing is moving towards folly. Wisdom is moving back towards God's Word. The only way to be wise is to saturate your mind and your heart with the Word of God. You cannot do that by applying all the facts that you learned in college. Instruction. Growing in character. Notice the fool despises these things. Later on in the same chapter, 24 through 29, because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. You neglected my counsel and did not want, in the heart, you did not want my character growth, my reproof. You didn't want to grow through your trials. You complained about the circumstance and you didn't want to grow. Because of that, I will laugh at your calamity and mock when your dread comes. Number six, in his heart, the fool does not want God's reproof. The fool does not want God's reproof. And you could put wisdom. You could even put character growth. And then, in fact, he despises it. So in Scripture, wisdom and fool has a moral connotation. It has nothing to do with the mastery of facts. So think about having an affair. What part of your brain is going? Your limbic system. It is going powerful. 
remember in your heart, so your limbic system here, your mind here, your heart, your ACC is right in there. It has four major nuclei. Two are stimulatory, two are inhibitory, both cognition, mental thinking, and both emotional. And so you can't fire both your limbic system and your cortex at the same time. Having an affair means what? Limbic system is going crazy. So what has to happen when your heart wants to be there, because you chose to be in that bedroom, you had to turn off, you had to inhibit your prefrontal cortex. Now, I've talked to several people about this, and it's interesting as I learn more about it. You say, well, okay, I know you've got a problem with your wife, but this night of the affair, you know, how about your children? And I've had several people answer of one variety of this or another. Ah, oh, you know, Doc, that's really interesting. And they won't say the night I committed adultery or the night of my affair. They'll typically say the night of my mistake, or they'll, they'll water it down a little bit. But on the night of that mistake... It's the weirdest thing. You bring up my children. I, I even tried. I could not think of my children. Why is that? Because his prefrontal cortex is being inhibited. Yes, it's an emotional relationship with his kids, but if he thinks about his children, because he's choosing to do this on his wife, but he really doesn't want to lose his children, if he thinks about his children, that's going to be firing prefrontal cortex. What are consequences? Let's think through this. I don't want to go there with my heart, so I will turn it off. And that's true. He doesn't even think about it. Fascinating. So let's now move to strength. Because uh, strength, I think, is a good thing to look at. <laughs> what is that? A deer? Come on, a moose, it could be a moose. That's a bull elk, first day of archery season. And this schmuck right here, that's JD. Now, if you talk to JD, he's the guy walking around with a smile, because this happened yesterday, first day of archery season. And if you ask JD about his trophy, here's what's gonna happen. He's gonna start talking about his trophy wife, and that's gonna take 10, 15 minutes. But if you can muscle through his discussion about his trophy wife, that happens to be my daughter. <laughs> now you'll finally get to his bull elk story. So you just ask JD about this bull elk uh, that he happened to get. But I, I was looking at that and I thought, holy smokes, that is a rack. Now, what is different with JD this year that wasn't there last year? You want to know the answer? You took D's leadership class, didn't you, JD? That's what you get. You are guaranteed a bull elk if you take D's leadership class. All right, so let's move on to strength. 1 Corinthians 16, one of the leadership class verses right here. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And of course, let all you do be done in love. So be doing things in love, but love has no place in any discussion without truth, that unmovable absolute T truth. Number seven. We are commanded to make the choice to be strong. You can choose to be weak or you can choose to be strong. To be strong means this, you stand firm in the faith, you hold to the truth. Lucifer, Jesus says in John 8, did not hold to the truth, but he let it go. You gotta hold, that's a proactive act of will to stay with the truth. Our natural inclination is to drift over here away from it. So you can't even act in love if you don't start with truth and it's a choice to be strong. So you might say, okay, how do we measure strength then? Let's look at our brain and it's a question of the heart. How much do we desire, number eight, our strength can be measured by how much we desire to master our flesh. That night of an affair, you have no desire to master your flesh whatsoever. Do we desire to master it and how well we do that? That's the measure of your strength, not your bench press, your 40-yard time. You could even go into the UFC and how many times you suplex an opponent. That would be a measure of physical strength, but we're talking moral strength. So now let's get down to where we can conclude this and talk about circumcision. And you might think, what in the world? Well, Brandon did it last week, so I'm just springboarding off of that. But the real issue is, is I'm gonna throw in cannibalism for good measure. Because you can't understand the heart until you understand cannibalism and circumcision. So we're gonna go with cannibalism, Deuteronomy 8, way back in the giving of the law. Then you shall eat the offspring of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters. That is cannibalism of your children. Not just some pedestrian walking across the street. 
whom the Lord your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you. So in the law, God says, if you follow the law, here's good things that will happen. If you choose to reject it, here's bad things that are coming. And one of those specifically is cannibalizing your own children. That sounds like a fairy tale until you read further in the Scriptures and you realize this happened at least one time, but this probably happened several. Second Kings 6 now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered his army and went up and besieged Samaria. So I remember under King David, you had a unified kingdom, and then it splits. You got Judah, Jerusalem in the south. You have Samaria, or called Israel or Ephraim, up in the north. So the capital of the north is Samaria. They never had a good king, never had a godly king. A couple of them were godly down in the south. So this is now the northern kingdom, Assyria being besieged, or, uh, Samaria being besieged by Aram. There was a great famine in Samaria. Well, they're being surrounded by an army. And behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's mad. Who wants to buy a donkey's head? Let alone part 80 shekels of silver to get it. That tells you how bad this is. So inflation, you can do like what we're doing, print like a drunken sailor and spend it. That'll inflate. The other thing you can do is live in a siege, a wall. You got the same number of coins because coins aren't going anywhere. They're just transferring from one to another. But there ain't no goods. So your goods diminish. That'll be inflation too. You'll charge 80 for a horse's head or donkey's head. I guess you could maybe suck some juice out of the eyeball because remember, they're to the point of eating their children. So I'll take the eyeball first before I eat my child. We move on. The king, whose name is Joram, said to her, so the king is up on the wall looking down to the people below, and he says to this woman, what are you belly aching about? What's the matter with you? She says, well, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and tomorrow we will eat my son. So we're under siege, a big famine, we cooked my son and ate him. There it is, cannibalizing your own children. I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. Number nine. Biblical prophecy is usually fulfilled literally. Don't allegorize things. A few could be symbolic, but most of the time that's going to be literal. Let's move on. When the king heard the words of the woman, what did they do in the Jewish culture when there's a bad circumstance? What do we do? We complain about the refugee. <clears throat> we, we have these outward displays telling everyone how frustrated we are at the bad circumstance. What did they do in Jerusalem and Israel? Well, they would tear their clothes. So the king tears his clothes because he's in charge and he doesn't know what to do. He can't solve it. He's being besieged by a greater army and they're cannibalizing their children and a donkey's head is 80 seconds of silver. That's a tough circumstance. Number 10, tearing the clothes is an outward sign of anguish regarding a tough circumstance. An outward sign of anguish regarding a tough circumstance. But notice the focus is on the circumstance, and you're demonstrating your anger at the circumstance. Then the king said, May God do to me and more so also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. So the king says, This is garbage. I'm so mad, I'm tearing my clothes, and I'm going to go take the head clean off the prophet Elisha. So he had Elijah and then Elisha. We're on Elisha, and the king is so mad. So if he's going to take the head, clean off the guy who's the spokesman for God, who is he really angry at? He's angry at God for his circumstances. Oh, that sounds like me. I swear you do the same thing. So what part of King Joram's mind and brain is going crazy? His limbic system, the fool gives full vent to his anger, and that's what Joram is doing. No concern about looking inward and how he needs to grow or change. He's just frustrated at the circumstance, wants to solve the best he can the circumstance, who wants to take the head off the messenger of God. Not a very productive means of moving forward. Then Elisha said, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, right here in the gate of Samaria. That will happen tomorrow. But think about it. You're being besieged. The enemy, of course, eats all the crops outside. So even if they're gone, how did you solve the famine? Well, there was two lepers sitting outside the gate at Samaria. They can't come in because they're lepers. And they're like, you know, donkey's head's going for 80. And they're eating their kids. Well, are you going to eat each other? Who goes first? So they say, we're screwed, so they're just going to go to the camp of the Arameans and say, we're dead anyway. They, if they feed us, great, but if they kill us, we're dead men anyway. So they walked out there, 
And what God had done is one of his favorite tools in battle. He created confusion. He generated a panic. He altered the minds. That'll be in the next time we talk about one of these as spiritual influences in our heart and mind. God causes distorted thinking, and the whole army of the Arameans just skedaddles. They leave their shields, their swords, their weapons, their clothing, their water, their food, their gold, their silver. They left everything and skedaddled and just got out of town. So A, you lifted the siege. B, you got stuff and plunder. You solved everything. Famine done. Amazing. God solved it. So let's look at this king of Israel. Uh, Here's Ahab and Jezebel. Their son is Joram. This is Israel in the north. The capital is Samaria. And so Ahab, Jezebel, they fought along with uh, Elijah. Well, where does Jezebel come from? She came from Tyre. Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians, undefeated in warfare until way after this, until Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and then Alexander the Great. So they were a world power. They were influencers. And you notice the king, Ethbaal, Etbaal. There's three of those over several hundred years interspersed, and he is the father of Jezebel. Notice the name, Ethbaal. I am with God. God is, or I am with Baal. Baal is with me. Baal is my God. Baal worship. His daughter Jezebel, Bel, Babel, Babel, Tower of Babel, Baal. Baal worship, Satan, that has been here that we specifically know of from the beginning after the flood, starting with Babel, and that's where they were worshiping the stars and as well as Baal. Tyre did this as well, and this is an attack by Satan to import Baal worship to penetrate against Yahweh. We're not in Jerusalem yet, but we're getting into Samaria. So that's the background. Elisha had issues with Joram because Elisha followed Elijah. He is a prophet of God. And on other unrelated things other than the siege, who is Joram following? He is following Baal. Elisha says, what do I have to do with you because I follow God? Two different worldviews. And so the king, Joram, hated Elisha. Let's compare this now with Hezekiah on the other side. So this is going to be Judah, which is the south. That is where there's at least a few godly kings. Uh, Hezekiah was one of them. Their capital is Jerusalem, the line of David. So Saul gets booted out, you go to David. This line of David goes right through Hezekiah, and of course it's all about Christ, the Messiah. He is the Alpha and the Omega. That's what it's all about. So let's put it on a timeline. Timelines help me kind of understand history. We're going to look at Old Testament, 4,000 years in the Old Testament from creation to Christ. David would be at about 1,000 with the unified kingdom. 850 now, it's divided. There's a north and a south, and Elijah is in the north with Samaria, Ahab. He's followed by Elisha, which is now about 840, and that's King Joram. This is the donkey's head siege and the cannibalism. 722, we move to the world power of Assyria. Assyria is now the world power, and they come and conquer the northern kingdom and captivate them up over into Assyria. The next world power, it's nice because it goes alphabetical, A to B, Assyria to Babylon. Babylon defeats Nineveh, which is the capital of Syria, in 612. By 605, Nebuchadnezzar comes and starts besieging Jerusalem. And then there's three different deportations. By 586, they have destroyed Jerusalem and burned it all, and it's, it's gone until they come back from the captivity. So that's a brief synopsis of the Old Testament right there. And where does Hezekiah fit? He's king at about 715. So he's well aware of the captivity by the world power Assyrians when they came in 722 and took Samaria. He's well aware of that. By 715, he's king. So that's a little bit of where Hezekiah fits. So now we're on the same Assyrians that took uh, the north are now at the doorstep of Jerusalem. Rabshakeh, the spokesman for the Assyrian army, he said to the people up on the wall defending their city, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, who's Sennacherib, what is this confidence that you have to stand against me? Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to Rabshakeh, Speak now to your servants in Aramaic, the diplomatic language of the day, for we understand that language. Don't speak to us in Judean. What is Judean? That's what is spoken in Judah. That is Hebrew. Don't speak to us in Hebrew, because the people here all understand Hebrew. Speak to us diplomatically in the erudite language of Aramaic. Yeah, screw that. 
That's not why I came, big butt here. Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me only to you and your master speaking Aramaic? No, I am here speaking Hebrew to all the men on the wall because you've heard about the donkey's head. You've heard about cannibalizing children. It's on your doorstep now. Here we come. These guys are doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine, and after that, they'll be eating their kids. That's what a siege does. When the king Hezekiah heard it, what do you do? And he got bad circumstances. You tear your clothes if you're a Hebrew. So he tears his clothes, but he does something interesting. Covers himself with sackcloth, and he enters the house of the Lord. He is seeking God. And if you read these, because it's coming up in your Bible reading program, don't get confused because these chapters, and it's in Isaiah as well, they're not chronological. So the healing of Isaiah happens first, and he has pride. He thinks it's about him. And then the Babylonians end up taking everything. He learned from that, and now he's humble because the siege is after the healing. But you, know, you won't get that if you just read it blind through the, the Scripture. He is seeking God. Then he sent, so he takes action. He goes to the house of the Lord seeking God. He sends the big shots, Eliakim, who's over the household, and Shebna, and he adds now the elders of the priests. So all the big shots go to who? They go to the prophet of the Lord to say, what does Isaiah, the spokesman of God, have for us? we got a bad circumstance. Joram wanted to kill the prophet. Hezekiah seeks the prophet for wisdom. Massive difference. Then Isaiah sent word to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord of God, because you have prayed. God knows about Sennacherib. He knows about all this stuff. And the big context of Hezekiah's prayer is not for himself, but it's for glory to be for God, for the nations to see. Because you've humbled yourself and you prayed to me about this, I will defend the city. So let's just look at these two again. Over here on Israel, we have Joram, and he is so mad when he tears his clothes, he wants to take the head off the prophet. Over on the other side, or when he reveals, is as a man's own folly subverts his way. So he is following Baal. He's not following God. He's subverting his own problem. He's creating his own problem. Yet what is his heart raging against? The Lord. He's blaming God. Perfect example of that. Over here, Hezekiah humbles himself and wants glory for God, and he prays. And what does the Messiah do? This is fascinating. God says, I myself, personal pronoun, will defend the city. A pre-incarnate Christ, as the angel of the Lord, goes out and kills 185,000 of the Assyrians, and then they tuck tail and leave. Jesus Christ solves the problem. Eleven. God is completely sovereign over all events. God is completely sovereign over all events. The question is, do we believe this or do we doubt? So now we're commanded in Joel to rend our hearts and not our garments. So I was just telling you about a couple guys that rent their garments. We're commanded to rend our hearts. And notice, return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and he's the one that can relent from evil. But garments and heart. Number 12, we are commanded to rend our heart, that's inward, not our garments, that is outward. Why? Inward instead of outward. Down here, God is sovereign over all events. Even what we think can be evil, God is sovereign over, and he can choose to relent the circumstance or not. There's a purpose called character growth. God is sovereign over that. If we're complaining about his sovereignty, which means we're complaining about the events, we can't learn when we realize we've got learning to do, and now we rend our heart instead of being frustrated at the events. Now God may change the circumstance, but we're not manipulating that. We've got character growth to undergo. Circumcise your heart. Stiffen your neck no longer. So I do circumcisions. I've done tons of them. Do them in the office. And when you do a circumcision, it's very interesting. You have the male anatomy. You've got two layers of foreskin over that that you remove back and you cut off. And what I have noticed over the years is that glands is red. It is tender. It is not protected. It is open. When you are circumcised, you are vulnerable, exceedingly vulnerable. Now I start to understand why God has this law of circumcision. Number 13, to be circumcised is to be vulnerable. You are open. You are exposed. You are exposed, if it's your heart, to the leading of God. 
You can only grow in character when our heart is open and exposed and tender. If we want those two layers of foreskin, if we want our heart protected, remember our heart is deceitful and evil. If we're trying to protect that, the only thing we're protecting against is our own character growth. So God gives us the graphic act of circumcision so you can see it, and I would challenge you if you have a son, a grandson, or some neighbor kid that, hey, we just had our kid circumcised, take the learning opportunity to go check it out. No, I'm not perverted. I want to see this because, and ask yourself this question, is that protected or vulnerable? What is it that God wants me to learn about my heart? Now I learned a lot more about my heart. So the heart and the mind, this is part two. We talked about our flesh, our sin nature. We looked at our heart and our mind, especially the heart and the interface there that chooses where we want to go, what we want to believe to be true. How do you measure strength in controlling our flesh? And circumcision is fascinating because now we go back up this. As we circumcise a little boy, we understand the principle. Now we have the type of what that really is there for, so we know what circumcising our heart. A female can do that too. We circumcise our heart. We make it open. As we circumcise our heart, now we can grow in character and we can develop strength. Strength to now in our mind input the Word of God into our heart so that we become more and more wise, more and more like God, so that we can finally now control our flesh. That's how it all ties together. Uh, so I'm going to pray. The men are going to come forward and bring up uh, our cards uh, as I pray. And remember, on your card, uh, go ahead and come on up, guys. Uh, but on the card, uh, remember D's leadership class. Uh, you can sign up for that, too. Let's pray. Dear Father, I just thank you for loving us. Thank you that you are sovereign. I always struggle to realize that you're in control of all events, that to my mind and to my heart, seem to be not in control, but my heart is deceiving me. Help me to realize that I need to expose my heart to you and to not protect it, but to expose it so that I can grow in the way that you want me to grow. And help us all to do that as we go out to be champions that influence the world for you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.